everyone. So we are continuing on with chapter 25. We'll fi be finishing up this today. Um, the discussion topic is uh, around something called Lenz's Law um, and Faraday's Law. And basically what it does is connects uh, magnetics, which we've uh, explored so far, with actually um, electrical fields and ultimately culminates in helping us to understand electromagnetic waves, um, that is to say light. And um, I think that it might be interesting at this point to actually talk about um, uh, maybe why some of this stuff is interesting to me. So um, maybe you'll find it interesting to you. But uh, in any case, I made sort of a, a list of a, just a few things that I'd like to mention um, about magnetism um, that I think is interesting. And uh, maybe you'll, it'll help you also to see, uh, you know, kind of motivate you. Uh, around uh, the study of, of uh, magnetism. So, I mean, we've covered a lot of topics. And just to review, um, so you've seen before, um, maybe I'll, I'll draw some things here as we're talking. So uh, you've seen before that if you had a positive charge and a negative charge, oops, let's see, flip this here. If you have a positive and a negative charge, um, they actually sort of attract to each other, right? And so then you've also seen something like if you had a positive charge and a positive charge, then they uh, repel away from each other. And so you've seen this kind of behavior before. And also, um, you've now seen that, that a uh, charged particle, if you were to put it into a magnetic field, let's just say that the magnetic field is everywhere pointed into the page, that's the meaning of these x's here, and it was moving in this direction here, we now know how to use the right-hand rule, which is that V uh, and B, which is into the page, tells us that there is a force that is pushing upwards. And so in other words, what will happen is that this thing will actually go through some kind of orbit that will go around in a circle. So, this, so those are some things that we've covered so far. Um, now, <laughs> I wouldn't blame you if you asked at this point, well, who cares? Well, why is this important? What is, what is interesting about uh, this behavior, well, it, there's a few ways that you could look at this. You could say, well, um, you know, we're learning about how charges respond to these uh, fundamental fields. And that both tells us something about the charges themselves um, and what charge means. And it also tells us something about these fields. So maybe that's one thing that's interesting. But another thing is that um, it helps us understand a wide variety of different uh, things in nature. And so your book covers some things like the Aurora Borealis. Um, and uh, we see that there's uh, that understanding the physics of magnetism um, helps us understand a lot more applications than just simply refrigerator magnets. Um, we can understand uh, how hard drives work or how the strip on a credit card works or MRIs. Um, and then we also looked at particle physics and uh, saw how a mass, mass spectrometer works. So there's a lot of different cool applications that we've seen. Um, but one that's actually particularly important, and I'm going to um, maybe show some some places here in our in our textbook. Um, let's see if I can get this. Let's see, let me put this on top. So um, this is on page um, uh, 864. Uh, basically, what this is is a, is a simple electric motor, and the real part that you know, we've done a lot of um, a lot of doing the mechanics, and I, know, I guess I want to sort of have an overview picture instead of just looking at the mechanics of things. I do want you to know um, how to calculate what the force would be on a length of wire uh, if it was in a magnetic field. But from this picture, I want us to understand that by putting a loop of of wire that has current going through it, right? Because here's a battery. Um, that it actually creates some kind of torque and actually causes the loop to rotate. So the real important part here is that we're turning the energy, electrical energy from a battery into mechanical energy, that is to say motion. Now some of the details about, well, how do you actually get it to keep spinning around and around and around um, are sort of hidden in this, in this little collar here called a, a commutator uh, that reverses the current every time it goes through a half cycle. Well, Maybe that's a little bit less important for our, um, our discussion right now, rather than to, but, but more, more importantly is to realize that you can turn electrical energy into mechanical energy. And so let me just write that, that point down here, is that um, what we're seeing here is, is that a simple motor is a way to turn um, electrical energy, 
from a battery, for example, we're able to turn that into mechanical energy. This is a huge revolution um, for humans, really, because if you think about it, um, if you carry around a battery with you, you can do stuff, right? You can make a, a car go places, right? Um, you can, um, you know, in, anything that you might be able to imagine that involves some kind of motion, if you can just store some energy in terms of electrical energy and you can turn it into mechanical energy, you can get a lot of interesting things done. Now, um, one of the things that we're going to look at with Faraday's law is actually going the other way around. That is to say, going from mechanical energy to electrical energy, right? So this, this is going to be uh, something that's called a generator. So um, I just wanted to give, give that sort of big idea um, that that's, that's interesting, that, that you can actually go between these two different forms of energy. And, um, and so we're going to need to understand Faraday's law in order to understand what a, what a generator is. How do we turn some you know, energy of, uh, say, say, cranking a, a wheel or having a hamster run around in a wheel or something like that? How do we turn that actually into electrical energy and charge up a battery? Um, one of the things that I just wanted to also review is that if you had a wire um, and that, that it has some current going through it, um, there's two things that are kind of interesting. One is that we, we learned that it actually creates a magnetic field. And we saw that because uh, we saw actually the deflection of a compass needle. Where's my compass? Here's my compass. Um, and so you saw that I, I had a compass and we had like a, um, like let's say that the, 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 the arrow was pointed this way. I'm just holding it in place right now. And let's say that the, the wire was going along this way. We actually saw that, and you can go back and look at this in the video, that the arrow actually pointed along the right-hand rule direction. It pointed uh, to go along the direction of the magnetic field. So in other words, that compass really is a little magnet. So a current going through a wire creates a magnetic field that, that goes around um, according to the right-hand rule. So my thumb points in the direction of the current, and the... the, um, the uh, um, uh, the, let's see, maybe if this is the part that's coming out, okay, then, then we're actually talking this direction here. So then, and then behind something like this. So, so if my thumb points in the direction of the current, my fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field. So, so there was a surprising thing that currents actually make a magnetic field. Um, that's kind of surprising. And the other thing is, is that if we had a, a current um, that was in a magnetic field, then it also experiences a force. So those are some kind of big ideas, and we're going to actually be using those, some of those ideas um, as we have our next discussion. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to briefly mention was this picture of ferromagnetism, is that um, <clears throat> uh, this idea that each atom, each little single atom in a crystal, um, is as if it has a little magnet in here. So that little, these little triangles here just mean like um, a little magnet, just like the little magnet of the compass, and it points in some direction. And so in most materials, they just point in all random directions. Um, but there's a few special materials called ferromagnets that have all of their little compasses pointed all in the same direction. This is not an obvious thing at all, but it turns out that this is what makes the material to behave magnetically. Um, so I think that's interesting. And, um, and so that kind of at least gives us some bigger picture of, of how magnetism is actually working in materials. Um, Okay, so I think that that's, um, I think that that's like, you know, more or less uh, kind of a big picture of what I was, uh, you know, hoping to say. There's, I guess there's a lot more. I mean, we could talk about the, the physics of how does an MRI work or any of these uh, applications, but um, I've given somewhat of an overview of how those things are working, and I wanted to sort of capture the, the bigger picture. It is, it is hard to do it in a in a very succinct way, but, um, but I wanted to review a few of those ideas uh, before we move on. So I uh, hope that that helps. Um, okay, so now um, moving forward, um, we are going to uh, be talking about Lenz's Law, Faraday's Law, and electromagnetic waves today. And uh, for next time, um, I'd like for you to uh, read the first four sections of chapter 26, which is talking about alternating current of electricity. And um, so some announcements is that uh, chapter, uh, chapter 24 homework, which is homework number nine, uh, that is due on Wednesday, April 8th. 
Uh, homework number 10 on chapter 25 will be due on Monday, April 13th, and that is just before our um, uh, third midterm, uh, which will be on Blackboard, and the details about this exam will be, uh, you can find on Blackboard under announcements, as well as um, you can find uh, some study materials under course materials if you look under exams. Uh, the midterm number three will cover chapters 23 up to 26. Okay, so electromagnetic induction is something that we talked about briefly last time, but let me go over a couple of ideas. One is that <clears throat> um, if you had a coil of wire, which actually is more or less the same thing as a permanent magnet, and I hope that I've convinced you that a coil of wire that has current going through it, it pr be, produces the same magnetic field um, as as a permanent magnet. And maybe one picture I can show you here, uh, just to kind of remind you how that's working, is that, um, oh man, it flipped it again. Okay. Um, just to remind you here that a permanent magnet um, creates a magnetic field that looks like this. And also, if we look at a solenoid or even just a single loop, you see that there, it creates a field that looks very, very similar. So here's a permanent magnet, and here's a loop of wire, and they're producing fields that are basically the same. So from that, we can, we can draw the conclusion that uh, a loop of wire is more or less creating the... Um, so um, whether we're uh, closing a, a switch that basically has a... Uh, a, a loop of wire making suddenly a magnetic field. Um, this is it picked up in a sense by this other coil of wire and this needle is deflected uh, that, that tells us about the current direction. And interestingly, uh, the moment that we close the switch, if the needle goes one way, the moment that we open the switch, the needle actually goes the other way. <clears throat> Another way of looking at this here is to say, if you were to drop a magnet through a loop of wire, you would first see the needle deflect one way, and then as the, the uh, compass, sorry, <laughs> compass, as the, uh, as the magnet fell completely through, the needle would deflect the other way. So, um, so basically, uh, um, we're, we're trying to make some sense of why this actually happens, right? So this is called electromagnetic induction. So we're, we're learning something here is that a moving magnet past a wire somehow makes a uh, makes current flow. Well, that's a little bit strange, right? So if there's current flowing, then there must be some kind of electric field that's, that's pushing those charges uh, through the wire. So in order to get uh, uh, familiar with the language of electromagnetic induction, we need to talk about something called flux. Um, so here's a, uh, a question that helps us to check uh, uh, our comprehension from the reading of chapter 25. Um, please take a moment to pause and uh, see if you can answer this question. Okay, so we're back, and um, let's take a look at the definition of magnetic flux. So we're supposed to find that uh, if this loop here is, is exactly head-on with the magnetic field, it's getting the most amount of flux. But as you rotate it more and more and more, then you're getting less and less flux. Well, what is flux? Flux is defined as the effective area times the magnetic field. And if you want the effective, uh, effective area, well, that means the area of the loop itself. So in this case, length times width, right, of each of these. But it's the, it's the part that is going head on with the, with the magnetic field. So in other words, uh, a, a loop that's turned this way is as if it has a, uh, an effective area of this length here, A, times this height that's not B anymore, but it's B times the cosine of theta. So in other words, you can take the angle, which is the angle between the normal uh, pointing out of the surface of this, uh, of this loop with the magnetic field, and we'll take the cosine of that angle and we'll multiply by the area and the magnetic field strength. So if you had guessed uh, answer as C in this case, um, you were correct um, for <clears throat> trying to figure out the magnetic field strength. Let's take a look at how to solve that kind of problem. So I know that in this case, the, I know in this case, the, the loop here is at some angle with respect to the magnetic field. So there's this magnetic field that's going through 
and this is the angle with respect to it is this angle here so notice that i made this this uh, arrow as being the normal to this loop here and i know that the flux is equal to the area of this circle so in this case maybe it would be pi r squared or so right uh, if they had the radius of this loop times the magnetic field strength times the cosine of the angle well we were told here that the maximum occurs if the angle is zero degrees but we want to know well what what angle is going to give us a, a flux that's half of this value well that's the place here where this cosine is going to be equal to 0 0.5 so we might be able to sort of remember this like okay well what angle sorry what uh, angle will give me a cosine of of uh, 0 0.5 um, but actually if you if we do the arc cosine of 0 0.5 um, this will give us 60 degrees so um, that means that if the theta is equal to 60 degrees then that means that the cosine of theta is equal to 0 0.5 in this case so basically 60 degrees then tells us that um, uh, if this angle is I guess we should maybe exaggerate it even a little bit more it's this angle here with respect to the magnetic field once that reaches 60 degrees oops, once that reaches 60 degrees, then we have half of the flux that we had compared with when it was exactly uh, perpendicular uh, to, the mag to the magnetic field going through it. Okay, very good. So let's continue on then. Um, so what do all three of these situations have here? Is that either I've got a constant magnetic field and I'm either pushing or pulling the coil through, which we sort of saw uh, uh, an example of that last time. Um, or I drop a magnet through, or I close or open a switch um, to understand how the uh, magnetic field is, is affecting the currents in this sort of secondary coil. Um, well, what all three of these uh, situations have in common is that the magnetic flux through that secondary coil, the one with the ammeter, um, is changing. So electromagnetic induction is when a current is induced in a loop of wire when the magnetic flux through the loop changes. So in other words, changes in magnetic flux create currents. So the next thing we got to figure out, and this is going to be a game that we need to play, is to figure out well, which direction will the current flow. And in order to answer that, we can use something called Lenz's Law. So Lenz's Law essentially states that nature tries to oppose the change in flux. And uh, so here's the, that's, this, the definition, the formal definition is shown here. But let me show you what that might mean in actuality here. So if the north pole, remember that the flux, or sorry, remember that the magnetic field lines point outward from a north pole, then they go into a south pole, right? So if the magnetic field lines are pointed downwards through this um, this loop here, and um, if the if the uh, uh, magnet is is dropping uh, into this uh, uh, into this situation here, right, In, into this loop of wire then the magnetic field lines, are they getting bigger or smaller? Well, in this case, the, as it's dropping down from the beginning, the magnetic field is getting bigger. And so in this case, uh, we have magnetic field lines that are increasing. And, uh, and so the direction of the change in flux is pointed downwards. But so now you might be able to guess then if, if the current that's induced in the loop is trying to oppose that change, um, remember your first uh, right-hand rule. And here, let me go back to, to uh, looking at the camera here of me. So if I have um, this magnetic field lines are pointed downward and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Then I need to make a magnetic field that opposes that, which means that <clears throat> my fingers are the ones going around uh, uh, making a current. And so maybe you remember from looking at uh, a, a loop of, of wire, that if your fingers go around in the direction of the loop of current, your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. So using that idea here, we can actually make sense of uh, the direction that the induced magnetic field will, will uh, uh, sorry, the induced current will be. So if the magnetic field is pointed down and it's getting bigger, this means the change in magnetic field is pointed down and we need to have the current uh, flowing through this loop in what looks like a, um, a, if I was looking at it from the top, that would be a counterclockwise 
uh, fashion. So, um, so how do we make sense of this of this situation? And so here's another example of what if the uh, what if the uh, permanent magnet was moving away from if we pulled it out of this thing? Um, well, here the magnetic field lines would be still pointed down, but they're getting smaller. That means that the change in flux is actually pointed upwards, right? So, so if the magnetic field lines are pointed down, but now they're pointed less down, this means that the change is pointed upwards. So this means that if we're looking from above, I would actually need to um, create a, uh, sorry, I would actually need to yeah, create a current that is moving clockwise when looked from above to create a magnetic field that points downwards. And that would change, that would, it would oppose the change uh, in the magnetic flux. So here's a sort of uh, list of tactics for how we solve uh, a problem using Lenz's law. Um, you might decide that you create your own way of, of solving these type of problems, but we need to figure out basically the, uh, whether there's a field going through a loop, and then we need to figure out how it's changing. Is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? And then we need to figure out the direction of an induced magnetic field that will oppose the change in flux. And so my simple way of thinking about it is that if my fingers now are going around the direction of the uh, current in a wire, in a loop of wire, then my thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. So if you're looking at my situation, the, the situation from above, so from, from up here, uh, this would look like a... Uh, counterclockwise current makes the magnetic field that points upwards, whereas a clockwise current makes a, uh, a magnetic field that points downwards. So you'll need to practice this and get familiar with it. So let's check our understanding. Please tr uh, pause for a moment and see if you can figure out which direction, if, if any, there will be an induced current. So if in this, um, we're, we're coming back now, um, uh, if you had figured in this case that the loop is going counterclockwise, you're correct. So how did we figure this one out? Well, if the X's are a magnetic field that's going into the screen and, um, and the, uh, um, and the uh, magnetic field is increasing, and that also means that the change of that uh, of of the flux is also pointed into the screen. So I need to make a, a a current loop that basically opposes that change. That means that I need to have a magnetic field that comes out of the screen. And so the only way to do that is to create a counterclockwise current um, that will actually uh, um, mean that the magnetic field um, it is generated by this this loop of current is pointed out of the screen and so using this kind of new right hand rule here uh, where my my fingers go around in the direction uh, of this of this uh, of this current which is counterclockwise then this means it will generate a, a magnetic field that is pointed out of the screen this opposes the change in flux let's look at another example here what if this uh, same situation but instead the magnetic field is decreasing. See if you can pause for a moment and think of this, uh, how, how to solve such a problem. <clears throat> okay, so if you figured it was the opposite, you were correct. Were you able to explain why though? Well, um, in this case, uh, the, if the loop uh, has a magnetic field that's going uh, into the page and, or into the screen, let's say, and, um, and it's decreasing, this actually means that the change in, in, uh, in the magnetic field is actually coming out of the screen. So we need to actually create a, a magnetic field that's going, that is going into the screen, and the only way to do that is to create a current that is moving in the clockwise direction. Now let's revisit something that we've done before, actually, which is that we want to take a look at um, this situation that has a, a bar uh, sliding through a kind of a U-shaped uh, piece of metal. And so what's effectively happening here is that we're making the area smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, 
I realize this is a somewhat contrived situation, and I understand if you might think to yourself, well, where does this ever show up in nature? It does not, right? But what this situation does is it helps us to isolate the physics of the situation so that we can learn um, how this lens's law and how Faraday's law really works. So the uh, direction that the current will flow here, we need to use lens's law. Well, I can see that the area is is decreasing, right, as this rod is moving over to the side. The magnetic field stays the same. So since I know that the, um, the magnetic flux is the uh, uh, area times the magnetic field, right, then I know that since the area is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, then that means that uh, the flux is decreasing. So if the, if the magnetic field is pointed into the screen, that's the x's, and it's decreasing, well then that means the change in flux is pointed out of the screen. So if, it, if the change in magnetic flux is pointed out of the screen and I need to oppose it, well, then it looks like I need to make a clockwise current in order to oppose the change in flux. Okay. <clears throat> and so, um, so we want to know now what is the induced current in the rod? Well, in this case, um, we might uh, look at this situation um, from the perspective of what does this uh, um, change in flux really tell us? Well, the change in flux, uh, if we figure out the change in flux per time, we can actually figure out the what's the EMF, or in other words, the voltage that's basically pushing the uh, charges around uh, through this loop here. And so we actually have a way to figure out what the um, uh, the flux is, um, and I'll go to the camera here so that we can um, we can take a look at this problem. So we have a um, I'm going to draw the picture and then I'll cut to the camera here. So we have a 15 centimeter long metal rod, 15 centimeters, and um, it's moving at a constant speed of 3.5 meters per second and the rod has a resistance of 0 0.65 ohms problem might seem familiar here and uh, we said that the rails here uh, have negligible resistance and that the magnetic field is 1.4 tesla and so we're trying to figure out what the induced current in the rod is so we'll go back to this thing and i'll flip it and um, here we go so um so we figured out that the current is actually going to need to be clockwise. And just to review, the reason is because the magnetic field here is constant uh, everywhere here and going into the page, and but it's decreasing. So it's the, the, the flux is decreasing. And so that means that the change is actually pointed up out of the, um, the uh, uh, page here. And so if I wanted to oppose that, then I should create a field that points downwards, which means that I need to, to have my fingers going around this way, if you can see what I'm doing here, as, uh, and that means a clockwise current is going through this whole thing. Now, the EMF is defined as a delta phi divided by a delta T, so a change in the fl flux with respect to, and, and it, per some amount of time. So, if the flux is equal to the area times the um, B here, and let's just imagine for a moment that, that um, this is A, right, this distance A, and this is B here, this distance B. Well, the area, right, you probably know, is area is A times B, right? But A is changing, right? And A is changing at a rate of, right, delta A divided by delta T. And that, that rate of change is actually 3.5 meters per second, right? A is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Oops. And so what I could actually say here is that if A is, is uh, this is actually the rate of change of A uh, times B divided by delta T. And what I could actually say is that this is the same thing as delta A times B, uh, this, this length B here, divided by delta t. And so in other words, I could resubstitute this here for the speed. So this is v times um, times this length here, which is, uh, it looks like 15 centimeters, times the ma magnetic field. 
And now suddenly we have that formula from last time where I guess this B was, was actually L last time, so it was VLB, right? So in other words, uh, if we wanted to then figure out the current, we could say that's the EMF divided by R, or in other words, that's V times um, the, I'll just keep it in our language here, this is B, and then capital B for the magnetic field divided by R. And so that's 3.5 meters per second times 0 0.15 meters times 1.4 Tesla and then 0 0.65 ohms. And now notice how it's quite complicated, right? But um, uh, with the units, but the idea is that I'm encouraging you to trust in that if you keep the everything as SI units, that the units will work out to be the common SI units. So 3.5 times 0 0.15 uh, times 1.4 uh, divided by 0 0.65. And so we get the same answer as last time, which was 1.13 um, amps is our, is our answer here. And so we got this answer now using Faraday's law instead of the answer that we had from before um, when we were just simply looking at um, how much the, the uh, uh, positive charges were being pushed to one side and the negative charges were being pushed to the other. So it's kind of interesting. So we're, we're advancing to using a more sophisticated uh, concept here called Faraday's Law. So um, at this point I'll move to a discussion of something called eddy currents, which is kind of an application of these things. If you were to move a piece of metal um, through a region of space that has a magnetic field, um, then it turns out that there would be an induced current um, that would actually uh, uh, oppose the change in flux and so much that it would actually slow the piece of metal down. And so I'm going to cut to a video here and show you that. So this is here. Um, I'll send the YouTube links um, along with this video so that you can watch the whole thing. But I'm just going to show a little clip from this here that shows uh, a swinging pendulum. And I'm going to I'm going to narrate instead of him. He has a swinging pendulum, and then he puts it uh, so that it's going to pass through a little magnet. And when he does this, something really surprising happens. It stops. So that's interesting, right? So it actually is um, the induced magnetic field, uh, sorry, the induced current in this, in this little uh, piece of metal here actually opposes the magnetic fields and, and the way that it manifests in this case is to actually um, is to actually stop the swinging uh, pendulum here. Let's look at one more example, which is something called the uh, jumping ring demonstration. And in this case, I'm going to also narrate here. And so you can watch the video if you want to hear his narration. He puts an aluminum ring here on top of this uh, uh, coil. And when he when he clicks on the switch, then you can watch the slow motion replay here. Um, the ring actually, there's a generated current in the ring that opposes the magnetic field. And so it causes the ring to jump up into the air. And this is also an example of an induced current, or in other words, uh, uh, you could call it as uh, Lenz's law, that nature is, is opposing a change in flux. Okay, so one application of this is regenerative braking. You might have seen different kinds of uh, so-called hybrid cars that use both gasoline and a battery, or even an electric vehicle uh, uses this concept where um, the electrical energy from a battery um, is, is uh, uh, stored when you actually brake. So in other words, uh, instead of braking by, by um, pressing a, a, a ceramic pad against the, um, against the wheels itself to stop it, Instead, um, there's actually a generator which uses the fact that there's um, some changing magnetic fields um, and, that, and that is able to then create a current which can then be used to charge a battery. Um, okay, very good. So, so now we'll be moving on to talking about um, uh, these two ideas together. So, um, so as you saw with that jumping ring, um, if we had a solenoid and we had a ring around this thing here, um, then just simply having a changing magnetic field actually induces a current in this ring, which is surprising, but that's Faraday's law. So we can conclude here that a changing magnetic field then must produce an electric field, which actually then 
push that electric field is what's pushing those charges around in this in this outer ring over here. So that's kind of strange. So there was a, a physicist uh, in the late 1800s, uh, James Maxwell, and he was looking at this at this situation and thinking, huh, if uh, if symmetries uh, exist in nature, uh, then I wonder if the same thing might be true. Uh, a could a changing electric field produce a magnetic field, and um, and so um, and so you might have noticed yes that's it, it actually it actually could um, that a, that uh, you saw this the uh, the effects of this in a, a charging and discharging of a capacitor, um, and so one of the interesting things here that that it was noticed is that a changing electric field can produce a magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field can produce an electric field. And so it turns out that if you have one of those fields that's changing in space, it actually automatically creates the other one, which in turn creates the other one. So in other words, a, a changing E creates a B, which that means that, a, that, that at some point it's going to change and create an E, and an E is going to create a B and so on, and these are going to create each other and propagate through space. And this is called an electromagnetic wave. And so the picture that we have here is that, uh, and this is also called light, right? So all light are, is electromagnetic waves. And also radio waves and also x-rays. These are all types of magnetic waves. And you might notice that since it's waves, it relates back to some of the material that we talked about before, that it has a wavelength. That is the length between two peaks. It has a speed and it has a frequency. If you were to pick one point on here, how fast does that one point go up and down? So this electric field that's changing is creating a magnetic field, and the magnetic field that's changing is creating an electric field. So um, they have matching crests and, and troughs, and they also cross zero at the same place. So, um, so here's kind of a, an interesting just challenge problem here that, that helps emphasize this idea that electric fields and magnetic fields really are connected to each other. So that um, if you were given the magnetic field, amp uh, sorry, if you were given the electric field amplitude as being 10 volts per meter, how could you figure out the magnetic field amplitude? So see if you can look back to the chapter 25 and, uh, and see if you can find an equation that might relate those two. Okay, so if you were looking uh, on page uh, 895, you would see here, that the, there is a relationship between the magnitude of the electric field, that's E naught, and the magnitude of the magnetic field, that's B naught, of a wave. That the ratio of those two is in fact C, which is the speed of light, which is this um, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So that's the speed that the wave is actually um, moving. So um, again, here's an interesting situation where we need to just trust and that using SI units is going to uh, allow things to work out. So if I wanted to figure out what is B naught, um, rearranging re, uh, uh, this equation here, I'll see that B naught is equal to E naught divided by C. If E naught is 10 volts per meter and C is 3 uh, times 10 to the eighth meters per second, well, it turns out, and this is not an obvious thing here, that it looks to me that a volt per meter squared uh, times second, so that's a volt per meter squared times seconds, right, is equal to a Tesla, right? So this is, this is a, a thing that I'm taking on a leap of faith here because I believe in the SI units, right? Now we could work this out and work this out, but I don't recommend it for starters. I think that to trust that E naught is always going to be in this volts per meter or equivalently newtons per coulomb, and that B naught is going to be in Tesla, and that C is going to be in meters per second. And as long as we do that, we're actually going to be okay. So uh, uh, working this out here, I'll say that this is uh, 10 divided by 3 times 10 to the 8th. And so the number that I'll get here is 3.3 3, uh, times 10 to the minus 8 Tesla. So apparently, um, so if you remember from field strengths from before, that if a refrigerator magnet was like, uh, you know, kind of uh, like a very like small amount, maybe 10 to the minus 4 or so, but it's still even more than this, right? So apparently, uh, 
10 volts per meter is not very much, uh, and it's not going to make that big of a magnetic field. Maybe it's measurable, um, but we would actually need um, magnetic, uh, we would need electric fields that were on the order of, let's say, about uh, 10,000 volts per meter before we would actually start to make a magnetic field that's on the order of about a refrigerator magnet, which would be about 10 to the minus 4 uh, Tesla or so. Okay, very good. So that's kind of a relationship here. The point of this exercise was, you know, to highlight an equation from your book, which is uh, equation 25.17. Um, maybe I'll just write this here in the notes. Um, this is equation 25.17. Uh, um, um, and, uh, but also to highlight that uh, when you have changing electric fields, that means you also have changing magnetic fields. So um, the notice how the electric field is moving just in the in the sort of uh, uh, y plane, right? And that the magnetic field is moving uh, in the uh, in the z plane, right? And so, or so you could call this as the the x y plane, if you want, is going to be called the um, the plane where the electric field alone exists, and then the x z plane, that's this sort of flat part here, is where the where the um, magnetic field uh, is existing. So if we just focus in on the electric field for the moment, we can call this, uh, this y, x, or x, y plane here, that's the pink plane that's shown here in this picture, as the plane of polarization. And um, that basically is saying that this is the plane that the electric field um, exists. So, um, so the last problem that we'll do for, for right now is to look, take a look at uh, polarization um, and, uh, and uh, trying to figure out um, how much light will be um, canceled by when it goes through a polarizing filter. And so um, we, can, uh, we can take a look here at this, uh, oop, it, we can take a look at uh, when light is polarized here. Um, I guess the, the simple picture that I have is um, if you imagine having a, um, a wire, uh, sorry, a, um, a rope, and you were to give it some shakes in the up-down direction, and you send it through a picket fence, then it would go through. But if you sent it from side to side going on one side, it would be flat on the other. And so you wouldn't be able to send it through the picket fence. And so the polarizer is the same way, is that it's only allowing uh, certain uh, directions of oscillation to actually go through. And so the way that this manifests here is that we can actually take a look at how a polarizer is rotated with respect to the electric field, and we can actually figure out how much intensity makes it through um, this, this polarizing filter. And so, um, so the formula that we can use here, which is called Malice's Law, um, helps us to figure out what the transmission of a polarized light is uh, from a polarizing filter. And so um, putting this together here, the I that is transmitted divided by i that is incident is equal to the cosine squared of theta. Of theta. So if in our question only 25% passes through, then that's telling us here that this i transmitted divided by i incident. Suppose that i incident was like 1, right? And if i tr transmitted was 25% of that, then 0.25 over 1 that would be 0 0.25 is equal to this cosine squared of theta. So we need to figure out what that angle is. In order to figure that out, we will take the square root of both sides of this equation here. And so the square root of 0 0.25 is going to be 0 0.5. It will be equal to the cosine of theta. And then if we take the arc cosine of 0 0.5, or arc cosine of, point, of square root of 0.25, we'll get that theta is equal to 60 degrees. So what this means here is that the angle that the polarizer should be with respect to, this is the polarizer axis, with respect to this uh, electric field here, should be 60 degrees. And then that will allow just half of the light um, to actually go through. So that's an example of polarization. Um, you might have also heard of um, polarizing uh, sunglasses. And, um, and so in this case, uh, you maybe want to take a look at some some uh, uh, fish underneath the water, and so without the uh, polarized sunglasses, um, you get a lot of reflection from the surface of the water. Whereas with the uh, with the polarizing sunglasses, 
you actually um, remove a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the reflections from the surface, and you get to see the stuff underneath the water. Now, how does that work? Well, it turns out that when water, when uh, light reflects off of a surface, uh, especially water or snow, it turns out that it does it in such a way that it is polarized. And so, um, if we can block, and this, I guess it's sort of a sort of a uh, cartoon picture of this, if we can block. Uh, some waves that are going parallel and instead just let the, the waves through that are, that are oscillating in the perpendicular direction, we will basically block the ones that are reflecting from the surface and instead we'll be able to see the light that is coming from underneath the surface of the water. So that's an interesting example of um, polarization. Next time we'll continue on looking at polarization um, and we'll also discuss why the sky is blue and, uh, and then we'll uh, have a bit of discussion around um, that light is maybe not just a wave, that it also has some uh, uh, idea that it is actually um, a photon or a, an actual packet of, of energy. Thank you so much for watching, and um, I hope that you have a good day.